Sveiki visi, ačiū, kad jūs žiūrėt šitą kanalą. Šiandien ilgai lauktas ir ilgai žadėtas Vaido Saldžiūno pokalbį su karo ekspertu Lenku gerai jums žinomo Konradu Muzika. Mes darom tai online ir aišku, mes kalbėsim anglų kalbą, tai jūs puikiai ją mokat ir aš sveikinuosi iš kartų su dalyviais. A very good day to you, Mr. Muzika. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good to be here. Same here. Good day to you, Mr. Suljunas. <laughs> Good day, Mr. Romanauskas. Yes, uh, uh, Konrad uh, Algis just introduced you as a renowned uh, Polish expert. And uh, But for those who may not know you, um, could you just say a few words who you really are and what is uh, Rohan Consulting? It's nothing to do with the Tolkien's Rohan, does it? Okay, so who am I? I'm, I, as you said, my name is Konrad. I have been interested in defense issues for a very, very long time. As, as a matter of fact, I was brought up near a village where Soviet forces stationed uh, back during the Cold War and they moved and they left everything behind. So I think that was the the initial steps that I took um, as an interest to get more involved in you know, Soviet slash Russian matters. Um, I worked for seven years for a, I think, well, world's biggest uh, open source intelligence company called Jane's, where I was a defense analyst and I, and I was working primarily on the state of the armed forces of post-Soviet countries. Uh, Russia, Belarus, Ukraine, and mostly Central Asia. Uh, and then in in around 2019, I left the company. I left James and I set up my own consultancy. And the, the main reason why I did that was because I wanted to focus on uh, the Russian and Belarusian armed forces. In particular, uh, I was looking at the operational capabilities of, of, of Russia and Belarus. So, you know, how they are exercising what they are doing, uh, what does it mean about the, their armed forces, how are they planning to conduct uh, future combat op operations. And, and then, you know, came the Russian buildup of, of, of forces near Ukraine, and we tracked it very closely. I think we were uh, the sole, uh, one, one of the main sources of information about the, the uh, buildup of, of Russians near Ukraine. We were tracking we were very good at tracking Russian troop movements uh, to the point or to the level of a battalion, uh, which was which was good uh, from open source perspective. Uh, and then obviously the war came uh, in February 2022, so we you know shifted our focus uh, more towards you know the war in Ukraine. But but you know we are still trying to look at the bigger picture of. You know what the current state of the war tells us about both Ukraine and the Russian forces' ability to adapt to the to the current to the current situation. How they are doing that? How they are conducting their operations? What are what are the their weak points and what are their strengths? Uh, and so on and so forth. And on the back of that, we also continue to cover developments in Belarus, just to see you know how they are changing their military in response to what is happening in Ukraine. And uh, I mean, I wanted this introduction to be slightly shorter, but... <laughs> it's fine, it's fine. No, it's fine. It's, but, it's one more thing, Vigo, about Rohan. Does it mean anything, Rohan Consulting? Why, why, why this name specifically? I get asked this question, question a lot uh, because people tend to confuse it with um, the Knights of Rohan yeah. uh, from um, the Fellowship of the Ring. Uh, but the, the truth is that the name Rohan spelled C-H, although it's still pronounced as Rohan, not as Roshan. Uh, Rohan comes from the name Roch, uh, and that's my son's name, actually. Oh, oh, so he, that's nice. So, so, he, so he, he doesn't know it yet, but he's going to inherit this company. Okay, <laughs> okay. You must be very proud of your country. Third in NATO, it's uh, manpower. And, uh... yeah, so, you know... Um, when I explained what we do, I made sure that I that I stated that we focus on Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. And despite the fact that we are Polish and we are based in Poland, we don't cover Poland. And the re and the reason for that is because 
Um, I find this topic too emotional. Essentially, I cannot de detach myself uh, emotionally from what is happening within the Polish armed forces, whether there is good or bad. Yes, I do comment on these issues, but we do not track these developments closely. Uh, plus, you know, we used to travel uh, to places like Belarus or Russia, so I didn't want to give Russians any excuse to detain me or or anything. Just to ask me questions about what's happening in Poland or stuff or stuff like that. So you know, we are detached essentially from the Polish armed forces. Um, we don't track developments very closely. Uh, obviously, we do that in the context of competition between the East and West and the impact of various procurement programs and how they can impact future war between NATO and Russia should it uh, should it come to that okay so uh, so with this introduction whether I'm proud uh, I mean on the surface it's a very good development you know the the regional security situation is what it is it's very unclear what's going to happen over the next three three to five years we don't know what will happen in ukraine we don't really know what will be the state of the russian armed forces of uh, in the same period we don't know who will be uh ruling in russia essentially there is a massive degree of uncertainty and i do believe that as a response to this uncertainty you have to be prepared for various contingency sen scenarios right so yes it's good that they are increasing capabilities they are increasing the manpower and so on but there are many different aspects that that i don't like uh, the first one is that there is no essentially a coherent strategy or i would say there is no actually there is no strategy that would tell you what the Polish armed forces are planning to do over the next 10 to 15 years. Okay, so a lot of procurement programs are actually done ad hoc. Uh, and we don't know what the end structure is going to be. Okay, so it's it's so the poll started from the end instead of from the beginning, instead of having this, you know, big picture of saying, okay. Uh, by, 20, by 2035, we want the armed forces to have five divisions. We want them to have, you know, this many tanks, um, this many uh, self-propelled howitzers, aircraft, uh, because we we want to have them because we want to them to fulfill the missions of. I don't know, conducting maneuver defense near the border, conducting active defense, striking Russian assets, uh, you know, deep into their, their territory, you know, having long range strike capability, because essentially what, what we don't want to do, uh, as the experience in Ukraine has showed, we don't want Russians to enter Poland by any means. So we will, I know, extend uh, our strike capability and so on and so forth. I mean, you cannot, you know, whatever you want. Okay. But no such discussions actually occurred in Poland. Uh, I, I would assume that they may have, you know, occurred within the general staff, and there is some sort of plan. But but essentially, nothing has been put to the public, and we don't know how much it's all going to cost. Okay, but both in terms of both in terms of how much, you know. Uh, uh, both in terms of what we are buying or we, what we want to buy and why we are buying it and what is going to be the cost of life over the next you know, 20, 30 years. Conrad, so, I would like to interrogate you a little bit more on that question, but uh, we will come back to it uh, as I have uh, more detailed uh, questions on that. First, let me come back to your, uh, well, not beginnings, obviously, as you said that you um, you have been in this business for, business for a while. But uh, first time in Lithuania you came into the spotlight was 2020, I think, when uh, your piece, When Russia Goes to War, Motives, Means and Indications, appeared on ICDC, ICDS uh, uh, reports. And uh, I'll come in again in a jiffy <laughs> to the theories of possible Russian moves on the Western direction, shall we say. But first, how those motives means and indicators have changed and what is the role of belarus in this since you've been well so strong on the belarusian vector okay so as we know the current structure and capabilities of the russian armed forces are 
significantly different compared to what Russians went in with uh, to Ukraine in 2022. Um, so the the armed forces is much bigger. Uh, it has, I would say, much fewer armored potential. Uh, but its reconnaissance capabilities, I think, have grown more significant. And there is a bigger degree of interoperability between different, uh, maybe not necessarily branches of the armed forces, but, you know, within there is more, there is bigger interoperability between um, inter-services, essentially. Um, but, you see, the Russian buildup near Ukraine lasted for... Uh, 10 months, I think, okay? And I and I would encourage people not to draw big lessons from that because it was done by design. Uh, and the purpose, I think, for the, for for this long buildup was to, you know, get the West and Ukraine to adjust the, to the position where uh, where a buildup is not something that extraordinary, okay? So Russians are doing their own thing for a while. We are tracking this movement. It's fine. And I think their plan collapsed when the United States actually announced that they have information that Russians were planning to invade Ukraine. The reason why I'm saying this is that because is, is that I think that if there is, you know, for whatever reason, a Russian buildup near the Baltic states or in Kaliningrad Oblast, I think it may be much faster. Uh, and while it took, you know, Russians ten months to uh, to shift their forces from different parts of of Russia near Ukraine, we actually calculated that if if they really wanted, they could actually conduct this build up operation within two or three months. Okay, so I think I think that's the biggest takeaway um, that I can draw. But you know, we we also have to remember that you know. Currently, the Baltic states, Poland, is part of NATO, and the and my expectation is that as long as NATO is a cohesive organization with the United States staying at the top, pro providing most of capabilities, especially in the air domain, but but also in targeting, I would not expect any Russian moves against the Baltic states and Poland, especially in in the in the kinetic uh, realm okay so no no uh no testing of nato's defenses using tanks uh, no, missiles or whatever sure the the problem with 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 belarus is that you know it extends the battlefield okay so if Russians deployed more forces to Belarus and if, if Belarus mobilized because Belarus is mostly a mobilization army uh, they don't have enough manpower now to go to war they would need to mobilize significantly actually uh, so this would extend the battlefield uh, especially against Poland uh, but also against Lithuania and it would force uh, NATO to spread its forces thin. Okay, so it it could give them initial advantage, um, but you know to the extent that they could exploit this advantage on the battlefield is a entirely different matter. You know, probably the first few days would be problematic, maybe you know a couple of weeks, um, but then you know as more forces are deployed to the combat zone, um, this initial initiative. You know, I would expect would be would be discarded by NATO combat power essentially. Um, so that that's how I I would see the use of of Belarus. Okay. Um, last time we talked was uh, March twenty twenty three, uh, when the Battle of Bakhmut was still raging on, and you were fresh from your trip uh, to the front lines, and uh, it was a well worthy podcast that we had together. It was about seventy thousand views. Um, it was before the counter-offensive, and then you warned about the mounting Ukrainian casualties and the impending consequences of those casualties, which we see now, the lack of personnel, the, over the year it's been an acute problem. How do you see the this, this situation now? And I know that you visited Ukraine recently. Uh, you've expressed uh, some even optimism a few weeks ago that now we see some good news with the personnel. 
But then again, uh, we see pieces in the media about the Pokrovsk, about the Toretsk, uh, the situation there, that Ukrainians are holding the line barely again. And they still have the same problems with the personnel on their side. They lack uh, manpower, they lack the reserves, they have bad command issues still. So what's your takeaway on that? You know, I am going to say that current Ukrainian po position is um, is a reflective of three problems that Ukraine has been going through for the past few months: uh, a lack of fortifications, lack of manpower, and a lack of am ammunition. So, and two of them are actually internally induced. So, Ukrainians actually imposed uh these weaknesses the, these weaknesses uh, upon themselves okay so yes you can blame the west for uh the the deliver uh, about the delivery of ammunition but when it comes to the most important issue and i would say that the most important issue is a lack of manpower then this is something that obviously it, ukraine is to blame for for you know what's been happening on the front line so we came back from Ukraine in late June. Uh, the situation from manpower perspective, I would say, was critical at the time, uh, where you essentially had units which received no reinforcements for six months, uh, and there was no, and and the while there was expectation that you know new troops would actually come uh, online, the current situation was that you know. It's it's very dangerous, and the only thing that was actually keeping Ukla Ukrainian lines, maybe not necessarily in touch, but but you know preventing what was preventing Russians from making a major breakthrough was FPV drones and the constant reconnaissance activity uh, going on across the, the entire Russian tactical depth, and the deliveries of ammunition that were arriving uh, to Ukraine. Okay, but there was the light in the tunnel uh, as we saw it, and New York Times reported uh, last week that Ukrainians were mobilizing thirty thousand men a month, uh, starting from May. So we should be looking at ninety thousand men mobilized in May, June, and July, and and I would expect that you know these troops are entering the front line right now. They are providing much needed reinforcements, although the level of training is not great because they spent only between four to eight weeks uh, in training. It's not great, but what Ukraine is looking at now, what Ukraine needs to get to the front line is the numbers. Essentially, you know, the human flesh, you know, guys who are going to defend every single position. So the 90,000 men that they mobilized that started entering the front line uh, a, a couple of weeks ago, according to the New York Times also, you know, they will, they will provide this boost or they will provide this presence, essentially, that be, because that's what Ukraine needs. They need presence, okay? Their losses will increase. There is no doubt about that. But the objective is to prevent the Russians from making any further gains and to stabilize the front line and seek a solution of or create a plan of what can be done in 2025 whether it's you know counteroffensive negotiations or you know what have you um currently i would say that you know i'm um, yeah i mean from strategic point of view yes that's relevant but from a tactical point of view you have to stabilize the front line first uh, because it's really bad. I think it's it's been the worst since uh, since uh, Russian spring offensive in uh, 2022. So this so these you know manpower deficiencies are currently being addressed. We'll see how Ukraine are going to address them because there have been also some you know discussions and reports that that essentially the bulk of the newly mobilized guys are actually going to be delivered to to new brigades, which could potentially be prepared for you know next counteroffensive or whatever, uh, not to the units which have been on the front line for years now and which have not received any reinforcements for six months. Okay, so we will need to see you know what Ukrainian priorities are and how they are and how they subsequently can reflect on the front line. But obviously, given that some of the troops 
newly mobilized troops have already been deployed to the front, and that's and this has been confirmed by numerous press reports. I would expect that the frontline situations should should begin to stabilize, you know, somewhere between mid August to you know mid mid September. Okay, because at the end of the day, you know, we are talking about 90,000 men. That's that's a lot of men. That's a that's a lot of manpower, and if they are put to the Donbas, then the situation should 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 stabilize. That's how I see it. That's the light in the tunnel, and and I think, and I think that's achievable. You know, given that you know artillery ammunitions continue to arrive, given that Ukrainians continue to produce FPV drones in in massive numbers. So the plan for this year was one one million drones in total to, to be produced. We already know that this plan will be exceeded and Ukraine is going to produce quote unquote significantly more than one million. Uh, but there domestic manufacturing capabilities is even significantly more than than 1 million i don't want to say what it is but it's it's really a massive number um so you know all these things things combined it you know it should translate on the onto the frontline situation uh over the next you know few weeks i hope just to reflect shortly on what you said to uh, what do you think is the reason behind the fresh recruits being channeled to the new units rather than reinforcing the existing ones that are on the front line is there any logic in that, that because I they are know. doing but they are doing this anyway now be- because so you are not only looking at the situation where um you know units which really need manpower are not getting it and you are looking at the situation where the creation of the establishment of new units costs a lot i mean so it costs a few million dollars to set up a uav battalion because you need to pay you know salaries you need to buy cars into buy fpv drones or drones you know whatever and then sustain that okay so so just to set up a a unit a uav battalion it's it's incredible amount of money uh, the creation of the creation of mechanized or tank uh, units is is going to cost much much more. The problem is Ukraine doesn't have you no know, available tanks or APCs or IVVs. Um, okay, so the units, the the new units which are being created, and which are called mechanized or motorized or you know uh, air assault uh, brigades, essentially they are now infantry. Because there is no equipment uh, for them to to man. Okay, so so this is and second of all, you know they are essentially. So when you create a new brigade, you need to have staff. Okay, you need to have officers. Okay, so instead of deploying new officers to existing brigades, you are essentially also sometimes drawing them from these brigades so that you can establish a new ones. Okay, so that's. That's another drawback, but when but when it comes to the question as to why Ukraine is doing that, I don't know. Okay, another problem to add to that a lot is the uh, Russian air power. Now, the common understanding and well articulated concern by the Ukrainian side is that the use of Russian air assets, especially Su-34s with their gliding bombs, is quite. Uh, important to the frontline situation. Now, how important do you believe is this factor for overall Russian operations? And if you negate it uh, by any means, deep strikes, uh, air defense means, so even the uh, air forces uh, of Ukrainian capabilities, were the Russian forces effectively stall then, or is just a uh, fool's hope? That's a deep thought. So, uh, so the so the capability of the Russian air force to deliver a a strike packages to support ground force operations have significantly changed over the past six months. Because I remember we were in Bakhmut in November or near Bakhmut in November last year, and we spoke to uh, one Ukrainian soldier, and he told us that. Uh, out of 100 cabs dropped by Russian Air Force on his positions, not one actually hit them. But now we see 
Russians dropping four cabs on Ukrainian positions and every single cab just lands where it's supposed to land. So if there is a tree line, essentially this tree, tree line is going to be obliterated by, by, by these cabs. So definitely, you know, currently the use of cabs, you know, in large numbers does have an impact on the front line because it gives, so not only does it destroy uh, Ukrainian positions, but it also have a moral and psychological impact on Ukrainian f- forces. Essentially, um, so the impact is is quite substantial and it's quite big, and and it has a big dent on Ukrainian morale. Um, so you know, if you manage to kill these guys off, yes, it would have an impact on the front line. It would, you know, most likely de- decrease. Uh, the speed of advance of um, Russian ground forces, but the problem is you will they will not be able to do it because there is a massive shortage of uh, short range and very short range air defenses for uh, again that you can use against Russian drones. You know, Lancet, Zala, Supercam, or Lanten. Uh, and I mean a significant, a, a massive shortage. So not only do Ukrainians have to choose carefully which target to engage with their missiles, but there are also cases where a unit can have more some systems than it has missiles for these systems. Okay, so that's the scale of actually of of shortages, and the Russians employ these um, reconnaissance and strike assets en masse. So if you are going to shoot shoot down Orlan 10 or Orlan 30, another one is going to pop up in a couple of hours. And then if you shoot it down, then another couple of hours, you're going to have another one and so on and so forth. So the scale of capabilities and the so the scale of maybe not necessarily capabilities, but, but the sheer scale of missiles that you need to have to degrade Russian air presence, and I'm not talking about combat aircraft, uh, only about drones you know, at, at a very tactical level. And these drones provide coordinates for uh, deep strikes using you know, Iskander, using cabs also, uh, is, is, is massive. And I don't think that both Ukraine and the West has found answers as to how to actually tackle uh, this, this problem. I mean, surely, you know, if, you, if, if Ukraine started bombing or striking... Russian air bases and mass also, and I'm talking about you know hundreds of missiles actually de- deployed or used or employed against Russian air bases that should have an impact. But the West, you no, know, the United States in particular, or, or essentially U- Ukraine's Western partners are not willing to uh, to entertain this idea at the current stage of the war. So Ukrainians have to struggle with Russian air power and they will continue to struggle because even if Ukraine is going to have long range air defenses, they are not going to bring them forward to near the front because the Russian uh, drone presence is so big and some sites are such a high priority target, then essentially if a drone picks up a, I know, a page, a page of law, uh, launcher, then you know every capability existing is going to be deployed against this launcher. So as long as Ukraine does not get rid of uh, Russian drones, it will not be able to bring up uh, high priority or you know high level assets closer to the front, and as as a result, they will not be able to shoot down Russian aircraft. The F-16 factor, as symbolic as it is at the moment, as investment for the future. Uh, do you think Ukrainians uh, have a reason to count on it, if not as a silver bullet, but then at least for another sh- threshold for the Western support and at least as a means to shoot down drones? Or is this uh, more of a public misconception to mask uh, those shortages that you mentioned, including the personnel? I think it's I think it's it's everything that you mentioned essentially. So you know, F sixteens are going to be mostly. So these F sixteens that Ukraine received, not only are they in small numbers, but also their capabilities are not great. So they are they are going to be used uh, mostly in air to ground attack role. Uh, 
far away from the front line. I think even Sirski said four, 40 kilometers from the front line. And they will also ease up some air defense tasks from some batteries and they will provide you know the first point of defense probably against russian cruise missiles okay but so that's how they will be used now but i think you know in the long term we should be looking at these f-16s to be another kind of you know piece of equipment that will you know attach ukraine to the western logistics uh, line of supplies uh it will you know over time also translate to the changes in doctrine, tactics, concepts of operations. It will allow Ukraine to, you know, be exposed to more Western way of thought when it comes to the use of air power. And over the long term, it will also, you know, transform the capabilities of the Ukrainian Air Force. But the impact on but 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 the current impact on the front line, I would say, is 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 going to be uh rather limited. Mm. Russian reserves, uh, what we heard uh, from how long they can make it, how long they can uh, continue this war, uh, the society, the industry, the military, the Kremlin itself, uh, the uh, wide-ranging assumptions have been from they will run out uh, of everything tomorrow to they can fight for another decade, outlive the Ukraine and the West. What is the assumption of the Ukrainians and uh, what have you heard? What is the picture that you're making? Uh, essentially, essentially, what I heard was exactly what you said. <laughs> okay. So, so I mean, yeah. So the the spectrum of of assessments varies significantly, uh, and I am not that much far looking when it comes to the Russian ability to recruit personnel. You know, currently we are looking at Russians continually being able to recruit between i know 20 to 30,000 men a month you know we met some you know high representatives from uh, security apparatus on the ukrainian side and they and they told us that essentially russian recruitment numbers are still incredibly high okay in in the numbers of 25,000k um, a month so at the very least they are able to um, at the very least russians are able to regenerate the units that that continue to bleed in Ukraine, um, but we also know that um, the scale of bonuses that Russians pay for guys willing to sign a contract with the Russian MOD have increased significantly over the past few months. Moscow, I think, is now at the forefront of this effort, uh, paying two, uh, almost two million rubles uh, just to sign their contract, which is about eighty thousand dollars, I think. Uh, 1890. Um, so by Russian standards, it's essentially a fortune, which means that there is a fewer and fewer number of, of Russians who are willing to sign the contract with the MOD and go to war. As a result, as a result Russians essentially need to you know, throw money at them and encourage them to sign by giving them high bonuses. Uh, but I cannot essentially estimate or predict how long this will be going on. Okay, because essentially I don't know what the so I, I mean I don't know what the Russian demographics is at the current stage, apart from the fact that you know the war in Ukraine is having a big impact on the e economy. Economy will not be able to grow because it faces a big shortage yeah. of of manpower. The problem is, I think, with 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 people who are actually putting economy above above the state essentially, is that from my point of view, for Russian state, the war in Ukraine is a priority. And everything else is actually seconded to to support this priority. So assuming there is a situation where uh, the number of volunteers will dry up significantly and the scale of Russian losses in Ukraine will be that big that essentially they will burn through manpower very quickly. I would imagine that Russia would, would uh, 
would take the take the step and uh, announce a second wave of mobilization. But this is uh, Be- the manpower you're talking, the demographics, yeah. uh, the aspect. What about the capabilities? That, because we've seen on the front a lot of the older vehicles, older tanks, etc., etc., uh, using the motorcycles, scooters, whatnot, for the transportation. You can have meat assaults, but you cannot have the assaults effectively. You cannot do that effectively if you can't have you know any achievements with any... Uh, you know, usual means of, of fighting a war, artillery, tanks, etc. Let me put it this way. I don't believe that at the current stage of this war, any side will be able to, to mount a successful large-scale offensive, which includes armored vehicles. And the reason is, and let me give you an example. So, you know, we, you know if you go on Telegram or on Twitter or anywhere, you are going to see, you know, how... Uh, how how Ukrainian artillery strikes um, uh, Russian troops approaching the front line, and once when we were in Ukraine, we were actually seeing a Russian uh, assault on Ukrainian position, or at least an attempt. Okay, and what we were interesting, uh, what we were interested in counting is actually how much time does it take for Ukrainians to respond to that. Okay, so we are in this UAV you know command post or yeah, yeah, UAV com, 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 command post. And there was a flying drone. Drones fly uh, 500 meters from each other so they can see, you know, and you've got a 10K uh, width of the front. So you essentially see everything that's in front of you to the depth of, you know, five kilometers easy. Okay. So there were these guys coming in. A drone picked them up. Ukrainians, you know, coordinated via sig- signal or something. And half a minute after these guys were picked up by a drone, their positions were shelled by Ukrainian motors. And after another four minutes, their positions were shelled by Ukrainian artillery uh, using cluster munitions. Okay, So Ukrainians needed four and a half minutes to engage uh, a group of eight troops, I think, uh, from what I remember, with cluster munitions fired from uh, you know, Western-made self-prepared howitzer. Okay, now it's summer, and if you see twenty vehicles coming in front of you, and you are going to see them from kilometers because they are going to leave, leave a massive dust trail, as we've seen on videos recently. Okay, this will give Ukraine a lot of time to prepare FPV drones, anti-tank guided missiles, artillery. Uh, places are mined. I, I mean, you. Ukrainians keep track on every single place where they actually placed a mine. So they are able to channel the movement of Russian forces to the area where, you know, to the area which is mined. And I do believe that as long as your opposing forces drones fly in the air and provide them with tactical warning that there is an, an attack in the coming, you will, nev- you will not be able to use tanks effectively. And there is no need to use tanks because the likelihood of them being destroyed is is actually very high, right? And there was a...